light the fires. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. A ship carrying a load of red paint collided with a ship carrying a load of purple paint. Both crews were marooned. Jellyfish have survived this long without brains. This gives me hope for humanity. <laughs> the fastest land mammal is a toddler who's been asked, what's in your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Patty, are you waiting for somebody else? Really? Was it something I said? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> like the man said, the only time I take my foot out of my mouth is to change feet. So. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so very kindly for the day that you've given to us, for uh, the things that you have exposed us to, for the opportunities we've had to ponder uh, your goodness. As we are trapped in time, as we are sojourning here on an orb that is not ours, this is not our home. And so we pray that you would help us to get and remain in a state of kingdom readiness. We are ready for your kingdom, for that is uh, what we long for. As our brother, the Apostle John says, come Lord Jesus. So we dedicate this time to you. We pray that you keep us from error, open up the ears of our hearts and our minds. And might this not be just an exercise in head knowledge, but that through the things that we learn, that we will be molded and shaped more into the image of your blessed Son, and in the process, give you the glory. It's in his name we come, because he said he could, we could. Amen. All right. We are finishing up uh, Genesis chapter 5. We had talked about Enoch. We had talked about how he... <clears throat> Uh, according to the New Testament, author Jude was a prophet that he prophesied and more than likely prophesied about the coming judgment, a.k.a. the flood, which we will be introduced to in the next cha chapter or two. Uh, the prophecy that he was given was, uh, was his son. Uh, his son's name was Methuselah. And the way the text reads, it says, after Enoch, Enoch lived so many years and gave birth to Methuselah, and then Enoch walked with God. And so it's almost like he had an epiphany. Um, I don't know if salvation would be the right word, but maybe. We believe that he was told to name his son Methuselah. Methuselah in Hebrew means when he is gone, it will come. Jewish tradition has the flood occurring within seven days after the death of Methuselah for what that's worth. All right. Methuselah is the, <clears throat> of all these patriarchs, he is the longest living that has been recorded, 969 years, so just shy of a day. If a thousand years is as a day to God, then just shy of a year. He, his, his life is emblematic because of its tenure, and it's emblematic of the long-suffering of God. That of all the people, of all the patriarchs that lived, God waited until the longest living of them perished before he meted out judgment on a world that sorely needed it. 
Okay. Let's see. And don't you wonder. Well, maybe you do. <laughs> I do. Maybe you don't. <laughs> I, 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 I wonder what went, went on in the Enoch family every time that kid coughed or caught a cold or fell down and skinned his knee. Or, and I wonder what effect that might have had on Methuselah when he see no when he saw his, his his what would he be uncle grandfather I don't know what he would be but when Noah started building a boat in the middle of the yard it hasn't rained they're not near a lake and this dude is building a boat <clears throat> I mean a boat I mean a ship boats in that day and age were usually no longer than 10 feet long and i got notes later on we'll cover all of that when noah starts building this thing 450 feet long all right so here we are genesis chapter 5 verses 25 through 29 methuselah lived 187 years and begot lamech after he begot lamech methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. Can you imagine living 900 years? Lamech, yeah. <laughs> well, if you if you if you stoop as you get older, these guys are probably roly polies. And Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he named his son Noah, saying. This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. All right. Lamech may have made the same mistake Eve did in thinking that the son was the promised son, which was the seed son, which would have dealt with the curse in Genesis 3.15. Neither one of them may have been too far off, because this is the, this is the seed line, right? We all come from Noah, do we not? Yeah. All right. Noah's main name means rest or comfort. The allusion is undoubtedly to the consequences of the fall and earthly toils and sufferings, and the hope of a deliverer exacerbated by the promise made to Eve. I can. Yes, ma'am. All right. We're now on verses 30 through 32. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years. I find just a bit of irony in that, don't you? Yeah, well, not only that, but God promised vengeance seven times over if someone killed Cain, and Lamech in his pride claimed 77 times vengeance from God if anybody killed him. So God says, let's see, let me add those sevens up. Oh, 777 years is how long Lamech lived before God punched his ticket. Uh, and it says, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old. Noah begot Ham, him, Ham, and Japheth. These were Noah's siblings, right? His, his kids, his three kids. So all of the children of Lamech were Noah's siblings, most of which all of which would die in the flood. Now, this guy has lived 500 years and had sons and daughters. His father had 777 years to produce sons and daughters. And we mourn, do we not, and rightly so, for those lost family members of our own. I'll well, multiply that by 700, and here's what Noah's dealing with. Huh? You, 
you multiply that by 700, 700 years, and Noah had a, a, a large family that he would grieve probably over having lost them all, except his three boys, his wife, and their wives. Eight people. And if you look in E.W. Bullinger's book, you'll find out that eight is a number of superabundance because it's one more than seven. He always tells you that just in case you're mathematically impaired that eight is seven plus one. Seven being a complete number and one is one more, eight is one more than being, you know, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. There are several observations that can be noted from chapter five. The dates that I gave you on that patriarchal timeline are not BC or AD, they are H A H. That's Latin for Anno Hominis, meaning the year of the man. And what that means is Adam was year zero at his creation. And we know how long he lived before he gave birth. We know how long he lived before he died. And we just ex we keep extrapolating from those dates to get about 1,656 years. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, all these ten names of the line of Seth are Hebrew names. This guy, this guy is adamant that Hebrew was the first language spoken. Okay, I don't care, whatever. That's what they're written in. For you and I, it does not mean that was the original language. It does not mean that's the language we, language that we will speak in heaven, but maybe. So get your <laughs> ready, right? Because that's Hebrew. Oh, boy. Uh, these years are normal years. They're not months, as some uh, critics claim they are. They're years. Adam was not 130 months old when he had a baby. <laughs> yeah. What would he have been? 11, 12? Uh, from Adam to the flood was 1,656 years based on that A.H., Anno Hominus, from year zero to the flood, 1,650 years. Depends on which text you use as to which sum you will get. But the normal Hebrew Bible is written in the Masoretic text, so that's what we use to get 1,656 years. I think it's interesting that not one of the seed sons, do we know what we're talking about by seed son? Okay, not one of the seed sons died in the flood. Not one. All right. We have one dying the year of the flood, or the week of the flood, or the day of the flood. I don't know which of those it was, but. When Methuselah checked in, it started to sprinkle. Everybody standing around going, what is that? Okay. Adam lived until Lamech, meaning Lamech could have got a first-hand account of what happened in the garden. And still, had the attitude that he did. The phrase, and he died, that appears constantly throughout the passage, apart from Enoch, shows the principles of Romans 5. Somebody asked me, he told me that they were at a funeral and the preacher said that death was part of creation. I said, no, it's not. Death is the responsibility of one man not God. Right? As our fallen nature is not the responsibility of God, 
It's the responsibility of that one man being the federal headship of mankind. Just as God is not responsible for Satan, he did not create Satan, he created Lucifer. Lucifer became what he is today based on his five I wills in Ezekiel 28. Culminating in, I will be like the Most High. And the Most High said, <laughs> I don't think so. And all of this in his head. He thought he would be like the Most High. And the Almighty said, no, you won't. Okay. Let's see, let's see. I'm trying not to bury you in stuff here. Let's move on. The most obvious and ubiquitous element of the curse is death. Now we understand that man is both material and immaterial. The material part of man was made out of the dust and clay of the earth. And there he laid. A dirt clawed shaped man. Until God breathed the breath of life into him and he became a living spirit. Or a living soul. So that's the immaterial part. And when God said, the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, he was referring to the most important part, which is the immaterial part. As we look around the room, what we see are, is the material part of man. We see the tent of flesh that the Bible speaks of, and most of the tents are in need of repairs of some sort or another. But within each tent is the immaterial part of man. And that is you. And that is me. One commentator I read likened it to computers. Computers have hardware and software. And what determines what a computer can do is not the hardware in most cases it is the software I don't back up the hardware at my home I back up the software that's where the data is at that's where the information is at that's where decades of lesson plans are at the hardware can be replaced and the hardware will be replaced but not the software Okay, <clears throat> I find this very interesting. After the communist takeover of, takeover of China in 1949, it took about a decade for the church to be brought fully under the control of the Chinese government. However, in 1980, whatever that is, what is that? 31 years? 43 years, 89 to eight, 49 to 80, 31 years, 31 years, 31, huh? Excuse me, 1949. Well, we're married, so. I better move on, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. In 1980, a report in the Far East Economic Review offered some interesting statistics. Oh, boy. It's the only girl I've ever been afraid of. In 1949, there were about 75,000 kilometers of serviceable roads in China. Today, there are over 890,000 kilometers of roads for transportation. Thanks to Mao, the country is wired for radio. Propaganda, but still. In 1949, China had 300 main languages 
and many major minor dialects. Today, thanks to Mao, there is only one major language, Mandarin. What the Romans and the Greeks did for the New Testament church, Mao did for the 20th century church in China. There are few illustrations in the world today as vivid as China and explaining the fact that surely the wrath of man shall praise you. Now, I don't know if you know about what the Romans and the Greeks did, but Alexander the Greek conquered the entire known world by the age of 33, I think it was. And they found him in his tent crying. Well, what are you crying about? Because there's nobody else to conquer. And he did it so fast, and he gathered so many people from so many different language languages that right face didn't mean anything to his troops, so he had to teach them a new language. And the new language is Koine Greek. It's the common man Greek. It's the Greek that your Bibles were written in. Thank you, Alexander. And when the Romans came to power, they were famous for roads. They put roads in everywhere. So a common language and a, a highway system made the spread of the gospel much more effective. Huh. Okay. That was free. Any questions on chapter 5? Because now we get into... a portion of text in the history of interpretation that may have may be responsible for arousing more curiosity and divergence of opinion than maybe any other. You ready? Okay. Now it came to pass, and this is chapter 6, verses 1 through 22, now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants, highlight that word, because it's wrong. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent and the thoughts of his heart was only evil always. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah, but, I love that word, don't you? For the wages of sin is death. But, right? Yeah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. How do you become a just man? By faith. Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by faith. Perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all, all, all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I will destroy them with the earth, or along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits, a cubit being 
normally 18 inches from tip to finger to elbow, 18 inches. Unless you're talking about a royal cubit, which we aren't and which we won't because we're not studying Ezekiel. And this is how you shall make it. The length, okay, covered that. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh, which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, First time that word's ever shown up. And you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort to the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. We will find out in chapter 10 that contrary to most stories, of Noah and the ark, the animals came two by two, but it wasn't just two pigs, and it wasn't just two giraffes, and it wasn't just two cows. It was seven pair, we'll find this out in chapter 7, seven pair of unclean animals and two pair of unclean. Of unclean. Seven clean, two unclean. Okay, we'll find that out in chapter 7. Way before the Levitical law talks about clean and unclean animals, by the by. And every living thing of all flesh, verse 19, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Okay. Verse 1, the phrase, and it came to pass. You have any questions about what we've read so far? I'm sure you do. Okay, we'll try and cover them as best we can. The phrase, and it came to pass, links what's, what follows in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, with the genealogy of Adam in chapter 5. While the previous section focused on Adam's sons, this section focuses on Adam's daughters. The Hebrew word, I'm going to do a lot of reading. I will tell you right off the gate, right out, right out of the gate, that there are, ba there are three basic approaches, opinions to what we are about to talk about which is the sons of God and the daughters of men. Position number one is that the sons of God were believers and the daughters of men were unbelievers. That's position number one. That position it was held by Christians from the end of the 2nd century to the 19th century. Position number two, that the sons of God were rulers or royalty and the daughters of men were not. Were not. They were commoners, peasant girls. And that is the Jewish position from about the 2nd century to the 19th century. 
Christian. Yeah. Whose position was the first was the question. All right. The third position is that the sons of men are angels. Sons of God, I'm sorry, are angels. And the daughters of men are human. That position was universally held from before Christ, from B.C. until the second century A.D. where the Jews and the Christians went. Okay? All right. Those are the three basic positions. Two of them I think are nonsense, and one of them I subscribe to. The Hebrew word for men is ha adam, H A dash Adam, which means man. The word is generic, it means humanity in general, including both male and female. The use of the word ha adam for man in verse 1 gives us a few clues regarding the argument that Sethites, Sethites, the progeny of Seth, were godly, while Cainites, the progeny of Cain, were ungodly. According to the proponents of the view that the intermarriage described in verses 1 through 4 is natural and not supernatural. The sons of God mentioned in 2 refers to the godly sons of Seth. The daughters of men mentioned in verse 2, therefore, must be the ungodly offspring of Cain, according to this view. However, the use of Ha-Adam in verse 1 is generic. It would include the males in both Seth and Cain's lines. Furthermore, the Hebrew word ha-adam includes males and females. Therefore, Genesis 1, we're always in 6, chapter 6. Genesis verse 1 is stating that men and women from both lines were multiplying the human race. There is no distinction between Sethites and Cainites. A third point that speaks against this view that the intermarriage here is between a righteous line and an unrighteous line, is that the descendants of both Seth and Cain perished in the flood. The Hebrew word for daughters means females. This is a different word than ha-adam, which refers to humanity in, gener in general. And it, that word, is the emphasis here on the female portion of humanity. Once again, the term cannot be limited to the female descendants of Cain. The basic translation of the verse is mankind, Adam, singular, and daughters, plural, were born unto males and females. By this time, there were many more than just two lines, since Adam and Eve had other sons than those named. We saw that in chapter five, did we not? Okay. And what you're going to find, what you're going to find out is, as we go as we go through the genealogies of Cain and Abel, God completely ignores everybody except the seed son. As he does in chapter 22 of Genesis, when he comes to Abraham and says, take your son, your only son, in whom you love, to a place I will show you. Abraham had two sons. In fact, his first son's about 15 years old and little, little brother shows up. And yet the Holy Spirit refers to Isaac and Isaac only doesn't even make mention of Ishmael. Why? He's not the promised son. And yet in the New Testament, it very clearly says Abraham had two sons. And we go, 
How's that work? Well, that's how it works. I just told you how it works. Because the Spirit goes on to tell you that, that, that the one Son, the one we didn't mention, right? Isaac, Esau I loved and Jacob I hated. Before the boys were born, before they had a chance to do anything good or bad, so that the purpose of God's election might be made clear. So it goes on to say that, that the slave woman, Sinai, meaning the law, gave birth to a son. And the free woman, Zion, Jerusalem, gave birth to a son. And it goes on to tell us in the New Testament that the son of the slave woman will never inherit. And so you see how the Holy Spirit refers only to the seed son, to the promised son. Isaac was the promised son. Ishmael was not. And ladies and gentlemen, that is what they are fighting over in Israel today. Abraham is our father. Well, he's our father too. Well, he was our father first because Ishmael is the eldest. Well, yeah, Ishmael is the eldest, but as we talked about last Sunday, maybe God's God's system from the beginning, since this is how it was from the beginning, was the younger having preeminence over the older. And only man's pride later on, as history goes, reversed that. That could that could be yet another diabolical plan of our adversary. Okay? So now we have nations that will not be at peace. This is what our Bible tells us. These two will not be at peace until Jesus comes and settles the issue. And that's what they're fighting over. Verse 2. Goes on to say, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. All right, be sure you're strapped in. <laughs> the earliest view held unanimously until the second century AD is that the sons of God were angelic beings. In this view, there is a material distinction between the sons of God and the daughters of men. The offense mentioned here, the offense that was part of the reason for the flood was a transgression of boundaries. In the second and third centuries, as I said, Jewish interpreters and Christian interpreters began to diverge from this consensus. Heaven forbid the Jews and the Gentiles should be in agreement about anything. And they went in different directions. This view whereby we have a godly line and an ungodly line was picked up by Augustine in his book, The City of Gold, and became the Christian interpretation. It remains so through the Reformation and into the 19th century. Don't tell me one man can't make a difference. The ruler's option found passages where human rulers were classified as Elohim. This is a true statement. Exodus 22, verses 8 and 9, Psalm 82, verse 6. And thereby posited the rulers versus the common girls theory. Okay. The Sethites, the godly, the godly, the godly. Excuse me. My watch is talking to me. Stop. 
Satan uses just about every tool available to him, doesn't he? <laughs> the Sethites found passages where those who were spiritual were designated as God's children. True, Deuteronomy 14.1, and thereby posited a spiritual distinction between the two groups with the offense being spiritual hmm, hexagamy. E-X-O-G-A-M-Y. It basically means marrying outside your group. Okay? All right. The possibility of either the ruler's view or the Sethite's view can only be considered in relation to how vulnerable the lexical case for the angel's view is. Lexical meaning, right, words. What are the reference? If the lexical case for sons of God, meaning angels, is solid and unassailable, then the issue is resolved. Both divergent views exploit the fact that not everyone identified as divine progeny is supernatural. Rulers of the divinic line are identified as being in a father-son relationship with God, which is true as are the Israelites, as his spiritually elect people. The discussion then becomes a case of semantic... I feel like I need to wash my mouth out with soap now. The discussion then becomes a case of semantic possibilities, meaning, what could the sons of men mean? What can we make it mean? Rather than lexi lex lexically... Determining what the Hebrew language says they are. Now, how should we assess this methodology? The narrowly delineated lexical base offers the purest level of analysis. Okay. In English, we are well aware that the special meaning that set phrases can have despite the existence of other logical possibilities, if someone hears the title Secretary of the Interior, it doesn't matter how many different ways there are to understand secretary or what things have interiors. The usage of the phrase as a whole must be investigated to determine its meaning, and such investigation will lead to recognizing the title as applicable only to a cabinet position. Using this methodology puts the angel's view in a position of great strength. Sons of God is the phrase. Sons of God is the phrase that we will take. If the lexical base, limited though it might be, points to angels, why should that view not be preferred? Because it doesn't make sense. Agreed, it doesn't. Because it's spoken of nowhere else in the Bible. Not true. It's spoken of numerous times in the New Testament. I will show you where. Therefore, since we have the lexical methodology behind us, the burden of proof lies with the other two positions to build a convincing lexical case for either their ruler's position or their Sethite position. Genesis 2 records the actual intermarriage that occurred. The first statement that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair presents the crisis. That presents the crisis here as it presented the crisis in the garden when Eve saw that the fruit was good. The sons of God in Hebrew is Benai Ha Elohim. That's the phrase. Benai Ha Elohim. <laughs> B N E I hyphen. No hyphen. I beg your pardon. B N E I. The next word is hyphenated. H A hyphen Elohim. Ha 
is a definite article. The Elohim. Sons of the Elohim. This term in the Hebrew Bible is always, always, always a reference to angels, both good ones and bad ones. Examples occur in Job chapter 1 verse 6 and chapter 2 verse 1 where Satan was among the Benai El Ha Elohim, the sons of God. And in Job 38, 7, where the sons of God were present at creation. All right, where we go, where we go. Job, yep, very good. Which is, which is some of what the critics use against this position that that phrase is only found in Job. What's your point? Well, it's found three times. <laughs> All right. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'm just telling you, I'm giving you the information. You're free to make up your own mind, as always. So everywhere else the phrase is used, it's always in reference to angel, a point on which all expositors concur. All expositors concur. Nevertheless, some wish to make Genesis 6 the one exception. Here we go again. However, it is not wise to make exceptions unless there are very good exegetical reasons to do so, and there is no good reason to make this one passage the exception to the rule. As in other passages, the term sons of God should be understood as being angels. They are sons in the sense of being directly created by God, and this includes angels, both fallen and unfallen. In the New Testament, the Greek term sons of God is applied to other entities besides angels, but the common element is that of being directly created by God. For example, Adam in Luke chapter 3, verse 38, is called a son of God. Since he was directly created by God. Believers are called the children of God in John 1, 12, because believers are viewed as what, William? New creations. That's right. Not neos. The term sons of God has the meaning to be created by God. The exception is uniqueness of the only begotten Son of God. The word only emphasizes his uniqueness. The word only emphasizes his uniqueness and that he was always in existence and not created. This is true immaterially, but can be construed, construed materially as the progeny of the virgin birth. The ancients viewed, this is where you get the term begotten, that people get crazy about. The ancients viewed this term to mean angels. The oldest Jewish view of this book and those living closest to the time when these things were written took sons of God to be angels, not human. For example, the Septuagint, dated about 250 B.C., translates this verse as angels of God. Josephus, a Jewish historian, right? Understood this as angels, and so did the book of Enoch and the Dead Sea Scroll documents of Qumran. Furthermore, in the Targum, the Targum is a paraphrase, a Jewish paraphrase. Furthermore, in the Targum, Pseudo-Jonathan also makes these angels. Seven books of the Apocrypha, Interpret this as a reference to angels. Philo and the Midrashim. Now, the Midrash are commentaries on Jewish text. Also adhere to this view. To summarize the point, the term man refers to humanity, and the term sons of God refers to angelanity, 
that's not a word. Angelanity. All right. The purely human view of verse 2 originated with Augustine and Christostom and it ignores the myriads of other lines of humanity from the sons and daughters of chapter 5. The phrase the daughters of men in Hebrew is a generic term for women and encompasses both Cainites and Sethites and every other female line of that day. There is no exegetical justification to make this phrase mean ungodly women. The reference here is simply womankind. Thus the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, meaning that they looked good, pointing to their sinful sexual attraction to the women. The second statement in verse 2 is they took them, wives of all of them, that they chose. The text limits the relation strict the relationship as strictly one way. The sons of God marry the daughters of men. Not, not, nothing about the daughters of God marrying the sons of men. Today, male believers marry unbelieving females and believing females marry unbelieving males. This is the norm. So this type of intermarriage would, in theory, be confined to godly men marrying ungodly women. And it says nothing about godly women marrying ungodly men. And we know things don't happen that way. Phil? This could be a stupid question, but Satan took a third of the angels with him at the fall. Right. Uh, could this imply that maybe angels were added to Satan's number? No. 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 The, prog the progeny are humanoid. The progeny of this marriage, ba this, this, this relationship based on the angel-human um, posit would make these humanoid, superhuman people. Well, I'm talking about the angels that actually married these women. Just yeah, no. So here's the, deal, here's the deal with that. Well, of course they're fallen angels. Of Angels that didn't participate in the fall, original fall? One angel participated in the original fall. All right? right. Okay. This, this would presume to be some of his cohorts that he took with him. All right. You have fallen angels. You have unclean spirits. You have demons. They're called many things. And in Peter, and we will get to the specific reference, he talks about a certain group of angels that left their first domain and are now in chains of everlasting darkness in a place called Tartarus. It's the only time that word is used in the scripture. And it's a specific place for a specific group of angels. Right? They will never get out. They will never be loosed again. They will never have an opportunity to commit this crime against humanity ever again until they are loosed to be thrown into the lake of fire. Now, Tartarus was the very center of our circular drawing. We have angels, fallen angels. We have demons in the abyss. In Greek, that's a buso. That are in chains and will remain in chains until it's time for them to be loosed. But these guys in Tartarus are never loosed. They are in the darkness. They are in the hottest, most horrible place of Hades right now awaiting their final judgment. They will not be, God will not loose them again on humanity. That's jumping forward a bit, but in answer to your questions. Okay. Those who reject the angelic view of this passage often cite Matthew 22:30, which they claim teaches that angels are sexless. However, angels are always described in the male gender, never in the female gender, never in the feminine gender. 
Now, <clears throat> that's not proof, proof positive because Hebrew does not have a neuter gender. Ah, but Greek does. This table would be a neuter general. It is, um, it is asexual. It's neither female nor male. Don't you find it interesting that the word Jesus is in the male gender and that the church, Ecclesia, is in the female gender? Hmm. We being the bride, him being the groom, makes perfect sense. Now, the Greek do have a neuter gender. So the table would be a neuter gender. The rug would be, the chairs would be, right? Most inanimate objects have a neuter gender. Angels in the Greek are never referred to by either the feminine or the neuter gender. They, always, they are always referred to in the male gender. Okay. Let's see. When Yeshua, Jesus, you guys hearing okay? Okay. Is he okay? Okay. All right. When Jesus was speaking about marrying and giving in marriage, he was not speaking of angels in general, but specifically of angels in heaven. Well, you're making that up. No. Read, read the verse. Good or holy angels in heaven neither marry nor are given in marriage. However, here, Genesis is speaking of fallen angels on earth, not holy angels in heaven. Moreover, in this passage in Matthew, Jesus made the same point about humans in heaven not marrying or being given in marriage. Therefore, in heaven, humans will not marry or be given in marriage. But what do humans do here on earth? Humans do marry and are given in marriage, in case we hadn't figured that out. Therefore, in heaven, humans will not marry or be given in marriage. Why not? What? We're the bride of Christ. We are spoken for. We are betrothed. That would make us at least polygamists, if not idolatrous. All right. <clears throat> However, Genesis is dealing with a situation that is happening on earth. One thing is clear. Angels do not procreate after their kind. God made as many as he made, and that's it. They do not give birth to angel other angels. However, on earth, they are able to produce something that is superhuman. Furthermore, it is wrong to teach that angels are sexless because angels are always described, once again, in the masculine gender. They are never described as being in the female gender nor referred to in the neuter form. In addition, when angels become visible, they always appear in Scripture as young men or more often mistaken for young men. How they do that, I can't tell you. I don't know. Are they able to take the form of a man? I don't know. And when they take the form of a man, do they get all of the internals? I don't know. Are they able to possess an unsaved man? Most certainly. Conundrum solved. Continuing in Genesis 6, 2, the Hebrew word for took is commonly used for marriage transactions. For example, it is used for taking a wife for oneself, taking a wife for someone else, or taking a woman against her will, as in the case of Dinah. These angels who intermarried were already fallen. And they fell when Satan fell, wiping a third of them from the sky. 
Now some of the angels who fell with Satan began to intermarry with human women, or Satan arranged for them to do so. The question is, why? Why are we even reading about this? Why is this even in my Bible? Any thoughts? Well, let me see. <clears throat> Our adversary is in a position not to just not like God. He hates God. God has the one thing that he wants. You know what that is? Worship. Worship. He will get it eventually in the tribulation for a very short period of time. But this is what he wants. The curse of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the seed of the serpent was well known to him because God said it to his face. So what does he do? The seed of a woman. Hmm. Well, I'll go down and I'll tear the joint up. I'll make it uninhabitable. That didn't work. He goes, hmm. I know, I'll tempt the woman. To cross a boundary, and that'll be the end of that. Well, that didn't work. God made them coverings, didn't he? He atoned, he covered them. Our adversary goes, hmm, okay, well, I'll just arrange for my son to kill God's son. And so we have the killing of Abel by Cain. And God said, I'll replace Abel with Seth. And the adversary goes, hmm. Well, what can I come up with next? Here it is. I'll fix the bloodline of the woman so that the promised seed son can't come from it. I find it interesting, and it might be pa a possible indication of how successful our adversary's plan was here, in that there are only four women who get on the boat. Well, when the flood doesn't work, what does he do? I mean, all throughout history. He, hear, he, he, he hears the Messiah has come. So what does he do? He gets Herod to kill every, every child under the age of three. Well, I'll annihilate the seed line that away. And just as God saved mankind, just mankind here with an ark, he saved mankind in an ark filled with a baby Moses. And there are many other cases where our adversary has done what he can do with his limited power of attorney to thwart the plans of God. Up to and including murdering God's only begotten son on the cross of Calvary thought he had finally succeeded, didn't he? Wrong answer once again. Isn't it infuriating that God is always one step ahead of you? So you ask yourself, why this? Why this story? Why am I reading this? Why is it so confusing? It's another satanic plot, in my opinion, to make it impossible for the prophesied seed to come 
that will one day crush his head. And as we go throughout our Old Testament, there's even cases, as we've mentioned in the New Testament. What do you think the Holocaust was for? You know, he, he, he can't do anything, and you'll see this in Revelation too. He can't do anything about the seed son. He can't do anything about Yeshua. Well, if I can't hurt you, pal, I'll go after your kids and your wife. That's what he does. He's after God's kids. He's after you and me. Can't do anything about my citizenship. You know, Christ came to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. He never intended for us to be living on life support, afraid of our own shadows. He never intended for us to be sitting on the bench. We're going through this on Sunday mornings, right? He intended for us to suit up and get in the game. All right, verse 3. My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. The Hebrew word for strive is the only time this word is used in the Bible as well. There's a term for it, but I won't bother you with it. But it's a word that appears only once. It is <clears throat> striving in the sense of restraining sin. The Spirit was striving in the, same, in the sense of restraining sin through the preaching of Enoch and Noah. However, we won't go there. We got a couple more Hebrew words, but goes on to say, "Yet, had, yet shall his days be one hundred twenty years." These are the years remaining before the flood. So our boy Methuselah has one hundred twenty years plus or minus a week, a week or so to live. 1 Peter 3.20 puts it this way, when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Verse 4, there were giants. Wrong word, folks. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. The word for giants here in the Hebrew, you looking it up? William? Go ahead. I think you'll find the word Nephilim. Some of your translations may have that word. That is the Hebrew word Nephilim. It is transliterated fallen ones, not giants. Fallen ones. Where did they get the word giant? They got it from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And the word that they chose, gigantes, was translated in English to giants when in fact it comes from the Latin meaning titan. Titan. T-I-T-A-N. Yeah. Hmm. So what we, what we see here is another plot by our adversary. I'm having trouble finding a different word than the word I want to use. Let's just go messing up or messing with or adulterating. What you what you have what you have in in Genesis chapter 6 is the real story. Angels of God and 
daughters of men. Just like God put astronomy in the skies, our adversary goes, "Mm, we'll call it astrology and we'll worship it and we'll have people reading their horoscopes every every day and blada, blada, blada. Now, our adversary may not be very imaginative, but he's very effective at what he does. And what he does is change the truth into a lie. And here is the truth. I don't know any I don't know any other way that works. I've tried the rulers and I've tried the godly law. I, I just don't it doesn't work. And and the Hebrew term is Nephilim, meaning fallen ones. Fallen from where? Heaven? Maybe. If not, why would God need a specific term for a sinning man? We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. We're all products of Adam, who as our federal headship fell. What the adversary has done with this is Greek and Roman mythology where the sons of God mate with the daughters of men and they, pro- and, 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 and they produce heroes like Achilles or Hercules. And where God says this intermarrying is detestable and throws the perpetrators into everlasting chains of darkness, our adversary glorifies it. They're called titans. I... There's a whole, I mean, I have pages and pages of stuff to bolster the angel and human woman position. I have pages and pages of stuff for the ruler and, not pagan, but peasant girl. I have pages of stuff about the Godly men taking ungodly wives. Hey, you women are trouble. It just doesn't. It it just doesn't work. Neither one of those works. Where are the fallen ones today? And when the spies came back from the land of Canaan, and said there were giants in the land. They were lying in order to scare the people. And the giants in our English is Nephilim in the Hebrew. There are the Nephilim there. There are the fallen ones there. And the rest of Israel is going, oh man, we be in big trouble. And yet, as you read the account of Joshua, as he conquers 33, 31, 31 kings in the land of Canaan, there is not a single report of him running into the Nephilim. So, I can only surmise that when God flushed the toilet, that was the earth. He got everybody that was not a fallen one. Adam Adam was fallen. He was atoned for. When it says that Adam walked with God, that's talking about his heart. When it says he was pure in all his generations, it's talking about his bloodline. 
So you have a man whose bloodline is pure and worships Yahweh. He and his family got put on the boat. And the door got sealed. And they rode that boat for 13 months. So we'll have some other stuff, but that's all time allows. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you very kindly for your word. And we can only pray that we have presented it correctly. We thank you for our ark, Jesus the Christ. We thank you for the prefigurement of Noah, who is, whose name means rest, and Jesus certainly is our rest. He beckons us in the book of Matthew to come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So no matter what the tumult is down here, no matter what scares the socks off us in the early in the evening news, we can rest assured that we are in your hands and we are in the Father's hands and nobody can take us out of either set of hands. So in, in John 10, where you where you speak of that, we have a witness of two. Two witnesses like none other. Saying that we are secure. We pray that until you come and get us, or until we transition through death, you will find us obedient and faithful with an eye toward the kingdom. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.